Hello my chickpeas, and welcome to my ranking on the cruelest PlayStation trophies in gaming. Before we get started, I want to outline my criteria for this list. I've seen a lot of trophy rankings, and I get really tired of seeing the same games copy-pasted between all of them. Crypt of the Necrodancer, Wolfenstein, Super Meat Boy, Devil May Cry 5. They're all notoriously difficult and rare trophies, yeah, but they're common offenders in the I've never played this, but I've copy-pasted it from someone else's list, so here's a really generic overview from someone who has absolutely no personal stake in it. I really hate those, so I've decided to pick only games that I know from my own experience, either from trying and failing to get them, or from friends who I've asked about their cruelest trophies. Basically, I want to be familiar enough with it that I don't have to consult a game ranks list and scroll through 14 pages of adverts between every entry. So if you're wondering why these are so vastly different from your own list of cruelest trophies, it's probably because you aren't me. So what I'm trying to say is, you might see my ranking and think it, and my opinion, is stupid, and that is probably true, but at least do me a favour and tell me your rankings in the comments below. Something to work with when I'm biting back tears over YouTube comment rudeness. And while you're at it, maybe like the video and subscribe to my channel here on YouTube. I make all sorts of gaming content, be it reviews, rankings, or other general fuckery, so it would be great to have you on board. Also, head over to my Twitch channel and watch me sweat these out live most nights at 7pm UK time. Without any further ado, let's dive in with our first entry, and just to let you know, there are no specific story spoilers for any game in this list, so if you see something you've not played yet, you might see some scenes or hear some locations discussed, but nothing specific that will spoil your experience. Resident Evil 7 is the infamous seventh instalment in the mainline Resident Evil series, but if I'm not completely bullying, the 23rd instalment overall. It was also a huge departure from the usual format of Resident Evil, which yo-yoed wildly and often irresponsibly between survival horror and action, and just kind of commits to the bit as the first mainline intimate first-person survival horror in the series. For a casual playthrough, it's roughly six hours. I say roughly because that depends entirely on whether you completely freeze out of fear for hours at a time time like I did, often having to walk away and just leave the game paused while I calmed down and begged my brother to come over and do a bit of it for me. That first silent, shadowy walk through the guest house, that terrified creep past a roaming Jack Baker, my god, that scream I did when he burst through the wall, the entirety of the boathouse up to, and including, that absolutely heart-pounding tiptoe through the greenhouse into Marguerite's screeching gangly entrance, then that panicked scuttle back to find ammo and cover, while that crusty beavered bitch followed me like a backwards hermit crab. Even playing through it multiple times for normal, hard speedrun and madhouse mode, I would still shit my pants, be sweating nervously around every corner, absolutely high on adrenaline. Just knowing that the jump scares were coming would often make it worse for me. I've never been so scared for such a prolonged period of time. I know the game peters off in quality around the time you start Lucas's section, what with the boat being one big lump of shit and the salt mines basically serving as a racetrack for you to dash through, but the game continues to do atmosphere well, and I felt like I was jumping out of my skin every four seconds, to the point where the tensing of my own back muscles was causing me physical pain. Which is why, when I pulled up to that gate for the first time and stepped out of the car, not 30 seconds into the game, and the first trophy, She's Alive, popped, just for travelling to Louisiana, it cemented Resident Evil 7 as a 1% on my list for all time. I felt my stomach fall out of my arse, the cruelest little trophy I've ever seen, because that is it, the long haul, whether you like it or not. Dishonored might tempt you in with a very achievable platinum trophy, and understandably so. It's super easy, super chill, two playthroughs, one low chaos, no kills, which might take a bit longer, and one high chaos, unnecessary amounts of killing, that you can rush through in a couple of hours. Both are very doable with or without a guide, even when returning to tidy up the miscellaneous trophies. I found the game quite taxing mentally. I think sustaining focus on stealth constantly without a break is a lot to ask of a player, but a single playthrough will never exceed 10 hours, so it's hardly the same issue as I had with a 20 hour slog of Alien Isolation. Overall, it's fine. The combat's used a little bit clunky and the 30 FPS doesn't help matters, but it's a fairly good game with an interesting story and some very compelling mechanics. Then we got three DLCs, The Knife of Dunwall and The Brigmore Witches, which were two story DLCs that added a whole host of chapters no one really asked for, but whatever, and The Trials of Dunwall, where I finally laid my patience to rest, buried alongside my self-esteem, which died probably sometime around the release of Cup 
head. The trials in themselves aren't too tricky. There's assassination challenges, free running challenges, combat challenges, and one challenge in particular stands out to me, Back Alley Brawl. A 13 wave based survival mode featuring all different enemies from a bunch of in-game factions. See, this challenge offers the chance to earn one trophy titled By My Hand Alone for killing all combatants personally. What's the catch? They all aggro on each other. Five enemies might spawn one round, 20 minutes into a run, two of which might spawn next to one another, one of which might kill the other in a single hit. That's it. Your run's void. They were on opposite sides of the map from you, they spawned and died within two seconds. There's no way you could have known, nothing you could have done. We go again, and again, and again. Later rounds spawn tall guys who will destroy every enemy on the map from a distance and are notoriously difficult to kill themselves. They're my run enders. Since there was never a necessity to learn how to handle them in the main game, I can't beat them quickly now. Vendors spawn, run away from you, then despawn in a matter of seconds between certain rounds. They need to be killed too. Executioners spawn and might just see you off this mortal coil themselves. It's a trophy that requires an obscene amount of skill and then an absolute truckload of luck. To say 30-70 as a ratio would be an understatement, because that implies that the game is only asking for 100% from you. It's RNG to the nines, requiring frame perfect skill, crazy quick thinking, and careful resource rationing. Oh, and it's a bronze. God knows how many trophy lists got stuck at 99% for this. So what I'm saying is I will never be able to do this. Released in 2015, Need for Speed sought to return to its PlayStation 2 roots by delivering a game with driving at its very core, capturing that nostalgia many players, myself included, who first picked up the franchise back in the day of pre-PlayStation Plus. I even had a copy of Need for Speed Underground on the GameCube, if you can believe it. One thing missing, however, was the classic early console difficulty. I remember Underground in particular being hard as nails, and this hair-tearing frustration didn't seem to translate into the 2015 reboot. It took less than 15 hours to grab the Platinum trophy trophy, asking humbly that players finish the game one single time and then maybe do some cleanup. It was rated a 2 out of 10 for difficulty and promptly fell into trophy hunting obscurity, or so it seemed. Less than a year after the initial release, Ghost Games dropped the mother load. Need for Speed Prestige Need for Speed Prestige was a free update that added three new bronze trophies, Speedmaster, Basic Bronze, and Gold Plated. These three devils added 41 trials, all of which with bronze, silver, and gold medals to earn, requiring a whopping 100 hours of effort at a hugely appropriate 9 out of 10 difficulty. It was a cataclysm that shook the foundations of well, basically nothing. I mean, it's not that big a deal, but a small handful of players were absolutely inconvenienced, knowing that they'd need to go back and tidy up some apocalypse difficulty trophies. See, even for those familiar with racing games, this was a smack in the face. For racing game noobs who grabbed the original title for a nice little experience and an easy platinum trophy, this was something much more. Because it is always the worry as a PlayStation trophy hunter. Do you buy an 100% a game on release, only to risk getting bitten in the arse a few months later when a Ragnarok difficulty DLC gets dropped on to your plate, steaming hot and buzzing with flies. Still, I hope the developers had a good laugh at the PSMP forums when it dropped. There's always some golden nuggets waiting down there in the Anorak mines. As far as the brand of you died trophies go, this is hardly a novelty. I know for sure that it's a staple of the Dark Souls 2 experience and probably features in a bunch of other games, but I felt like Crash was the best example of this cruel little trophy being that from a distance, you'd have no idea how cruel a game this can really be, especially when going for the 100%. A lot of people see Crash Bandicoot as a children's game because of its cutesy graphics and colorful aesthetic, and on some level they'd be right. Like, yes, Crash is a game that can be played and enjoyed by children, but it's always had a skill ceiling that can only be reached by adults, probably because they're taller. Remastered back in 2017 for the PlayStation 4, Xbox One and Nintendo Switch, the Crash Insane Trilogy did actually tone down the brutal rudeness of the original installments and polish the gameplay ever so slightly, but the trial and error style practice makes perfect gameplay remained a staple. Challenging, frustrating and even silly, but rewarding. The whimsical slapstick humour is exemplified best in this trophy, Feed Me, a reference to the red Venus flytrap plants that will eat you, said plants featuring in the first level of the game and very likely being the cause of your first death in the title. Watching Crash get chewed to pieces by one such plant as the trophy pops within your first minute of the game is a laughably deflating feeling and an unforgettable one. For anyone who picked up the game assuming it would be a nice walk in the park, and for me, having just finished the Spyro trilogy, you can bet I had that assumption. It's a hilariously rude awakening and one that is proven immediately wrong. It's almost like a badge of honour to say that the first thing you did upon stepping into this title, arguably a children's title at that, was eat shit and die. Well done you.
Question. If you had 14 free hours, how would you spend them? If you had 8 hours of sleep in a 24 hour period, you'd only theoretically have 16 hours to play with. Meaning that whatever you spent those 14 hours doing is basically a full day lost. I mean, no one but the depressed ever has a full 8 hours of sleep, but hear me out. Now, what would you do if 6 hours into those 14 hours, you lost all your progress and had to start again? Would you go for a 20 hour day, or would you put it down and never come back to it? What if it was lost 10 hours in? This is the precarious tightrope of nerves you might be walking if you ever attempted the 7 day survivor trophy on Dead Rising, requiring you to survive the survival free roam mode for 10 full in-game days. One in-game day being 2 hours real time, so 14 hours total. Not only that, but your health will constantly be ticking down, meaning you need a steady supply of food, and spoiler alert, but there's less food available than there is health needed for 14 days, so you'll need to go out into the big scary world and scrounge it from other survivors and psychopaths. Many of which, like Adam the Clown with his twin chainsaws, can stun knock you into a swift death, wiping your run off the planet in 8 minutes flat. It has to be done entirely in one sitting too, no saves and reloads, so if the game crashes then you have to start all the way from the beginning. And why might that be such a concern, you ask? Well, released originally for the Xbox 360 back in 2006, Dead Rising was eventually ported to the PlayStation 4 in 2016. The problem with Dead Rising ports, as many fans of the series will know, is that they are dog shit. While Dead Rising 2 and off the record run fine on the PlayStation 3, like they crash occasionally, you can barely manage two hours on their respective PlayStation ports without crashes, especially on Off The Record, which trips and falls over itself every chance it gets. Now, on the PlayStation 4 port of Dead Rising, which requires 14 hours of uninterrupted focus and engagement, imagine that game crumpling in on itself like a house of cards at the 10 hour mark. There's even a brilliant unconfirmed rumour, only unconfirmed in the fact that no one wants to play seven hours of this game just to check whether it's true, that walking into the food court after the third day causes the game to crash, meaning that the biggest source of food in survival mode is permanently unavailable to you less than halfway into your gauntlet. There are methods of making this easier, like unlocking the blaster, but ultimately this is going to come down to careful planning, resource and health management, and a whole lot of luck. It can even get a bit boring at times when you're just sitting in the same place for two hours at a time, watching your health trickle down, and occasionally eating a donut. You could always leave it for a rainy day, to be fair. Like, if there was a period where we were all stuck at home inside for long stretches of time. Like if we had to work from home for any reason, or if we were banned from meeting others socially, maybe one day. For number 6 on our list, we turn to a trophy that's straight up rude. Slayer Supreme requires the compliant trophy hunter to reach mastery level 40 on Dauntless, a cross-platform free-to-play game that's hugely popular with the Fortnite dregs and anyone who knows what all the different colours of monster mean. So naturally, since I fit into neither of those demographics, I love it. It's the perfect game to zone out with, just hack and smash away at innocent creatures that want to be left alone. I will be real with you, Dauntless doesn't really have enough content to ask this colossal task of you, or at least at time of writing it didn't have enough content to ask that. I know they're always adding shit to this game. Dauntless is a really good game, and it's one I enjoy, and it plays kind of like a stripped down Monster Hunter world, and similar to Monster Hunter, Dauntless offers you a lovely ultra rare trophy if you do it the kindness of reaching mastery level 40. See, ranks in Dauntless aren't earned by gaining XP or finishing quests, they are earned by ticking boxes on individual monster and weapon sheets. Each box you tick adds to a total, the total number of ticked boxes required to reach level 40 being something well over 600. So to level most efficiently, you should try and make as many different weapon and armor sets as you can, and level them by killing as many different enemy types as you can, often meaning you farm a wide variety of types of monster and map. It's a really annoying thing to keep track of. I'd often have to keep written lists of the monsters I needed to kill and weapons I needed to craft, but they're so obscure that they just look like a pharmacy receipt to the untrained eye. Despite all that planning, it'll still take you around 40 hours to get from level 1 to level 30, and then probably another 40 hours to drag yourself up those final 10 levels to level 4. 40, so a good 80 hours total. And while the game doesn't run out of stuff for you to do, there's always gear to farm and other miscellaneous trophies to go for, but in the early days before they added all the fun stuff, that was it. Just spend 40 hours getting levels. You can at least rest assured that it's fun now, if not still a bit of a pain. Slap on an armour set, slap on a weapon, go to the opposing elements map, farm until you run dry on heals and patients, come back, craft more. I made a spreadsheet for it that looks a little bit like an ADHD sneeze. This is it. I could break it down for you, but I, I know you don't really care. Anyway, on to the next one. 
Limbo is often a familiar site for most gamers, at least those that have been alive for more than 15 years. For those that haven't, it's a game about trial and error. It's a side-scrolling, puzzle-based game that I feel was someone's practice in physics turned actual game. It seems to play like one anyway. Not that it's an issue, it just has that feel of an early Xbox era tech demo, like something a super advanced set of students might put together for a big combined final project. You pilot Limbo as a little boy, not so secretly in Limbo, wandering around in the terrifying world beyond the grave, getting chewed up by little sores and chased by spiders. It's a game about encountering new situations, trying to work through them, dying, learning from that death, and trying again. There's very little reward beyond your own sense of achievement. Each finished puzzle is just leading to another, harder puzzle, and can feel like a miserable slog the first time through. Every inch forward you step is another death waiting to happen, but you learn as you go. By the time you've finished your first playthrough, you'll die hundreds of times, likely to that horrible two-box saw puzzle right in the middle past the hotel. All the annoying gravity challenges at the end, or the machine guns, or the bear traps, or the electrified rail thing, you name it. Thousands upon thousands of collective virtual deaths have been the direct result of it. This game, however, asks you to finish it with five deaths or less, and this is tricky even with a walkthrough. Sure, you can watch a video walkthrough and see what you need to do, but it requires an understanding of the physics of the game, your own weight and momentum, the speed of whatever you're using, baiting or balancing, the time of the traps and jumps and enemies to finish. Honestly, it's a fun trophy and a fitting one, a perfect culmination of everything the game teaches you, a lot of worthwhile effort, and a great reward to earn. It's hard though. Consequently, I tried this for an hour per day and it still took way more than a week. I'm sure there's a few absolute rain men out there that managed to get it easily, but for me this was a crazy trophy that easily tripled my playtime on this game. I'm sure this is a trophy you've all heard about, considering how Fall Guys became such a huge phenomenon during the COVID lockdown, but for the sake of explanation, the infallible trophy requires you to win five episodes in a row. An episode being kind of a tournament comprised of between three and eight minigames. Fall Guys is a party game at top level, where you and 40 odd other weird plasticine chickens need to navigate various minigames to win tournaments, either as part of a team or solo. Each tournament has five rounds of random games, with only one winner declared at the very end. Fall Guys combines individual games with team games, meaning that not only do you need to, by the sheer luck of the draw, scrape wins by yourself, but you also need to pray for teammates and luck enough to go through to the next round. Sometimes a team game will just wipe your streak and there's nothing you could have done to prevent that, just a scale tipped in the wrong direction, despite how well you played as an individual, putting you right back to square one. There is an enormous number of minigames available, some of them being great and some of them being vastly stupid, and without an irritating amount of skill and an absolute boatload of luck, this trophy will stay firmly out of your reach. There was there was even a point where the developers accidentally patched in a way this could be boosted in private servers, and trophy hunters absolutely flung themselves at the possibility. However, I'm pretty sure they patched that patch within about 24 hours, so whoever managed to grab that, good for you. By now, the hype for this game has cooled down. With a smaller, more dedicated player base, you're constantly coming up not only against absolute sweats who live and breathe this title, but also hackers who've bypassed the game's seemingly flimsy security and just fly to the finish line or remain impervious to any attacks. All I can say is, good luck. Fallout 4 released back in 2015 to some very mixed reviews. I mean, I say mixed like there was variety. People seemed to either love it or hate it. Personally, I found it a bit dry. But really, I've never quite jived with the Fallout series, so I don't know what kind of road to Damascus moment I expected there. Regardless of your opinion on the main game, the Nuka World DLC was honestly pretty good. Well, I mean, it had good potential. It was an interesting concept. It was fresh and fairly new. The DLC had a particularly strong start, but then it smoothed out very quickly into Disneyland-style zones, each with their own gimmick and story. Some of them fairly hit and miss, but largely featured some really interesting maps, ideas, and mechanics. Handled by a more capable company, the Nuka World DLC could have been something really memorable. One aforementioned mechanic was the Nuka Arcade, a much less cool concept some Bethesda sadist probably slipped into the design mockups while everyone was sleeping. Found in the central hub of Nuka World, the arcade featured a good handful of games to play, for which you could win tickets, i.e. points, and earn some fabulous prizes. A hundred thousand tickets though? No. No, 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 no. No. You see, this new DLC bought with it a very insidious little trophy list. Beyond all the story trophies, all the Nuka Cola cooking, all the scav magazines, all the raider work, eyes on the prize sat and waited with a banana sized smirk. You see, each Nuka World Arcade game offers a measly portion of tickets per success, like absolute scraps, and you needed a hundred thousand. The skee ball hole could climb out of its bearings and suck me off, and it still wouldn't be so fun that I'd spend that much time on it. And considering all the other available arcade games stopped being fun and about half 
half the time it took to load them, this was a cheeky ask of Fallout 4. Luckily, keen Fallout trophy hunters devised a way to earn these tickets the easy way. Not a quick way, but an easy way. By buying the spray and pray rifle from some bitch in Bunker Hill, which fires a huge blast of spread out bullets in one shot, you can play the duck shooting game and just occasionally tap R2, whilst presumably catching up with friends, watching a nice documentary, or pulling your toenails out one by one, because you may as well with the time it still takes even with this method. And the worst part of it? The prizes are kinda shit. Like Randy Pitchford's USB, Splitgate might be something you remember being very relevant at one point in time, before just randomly and very conveniently dipping out of the public's immediate memory, abandoned by general discourse, something everyone's heard of but no one really knows the full truth of. And the cruelest trophy on that list was called So It Begins, which required players to complete, not win, but simply finish one single match. Why? Well, I'll explain. Splitgate was a free-to-play game that absolutely exploded in popularity on release back in 2020. I think Epic Games even offered to buy it at one point and were rejected, only for the game to promptly collapse and die about a week later. It was a cool concept, basically Doom or Quake-style FPS combat with a set arsenal, except players can plant portals around through which they can teleport during matches, except it had only a handful of game modes, maps, and very little wiggle room in the meta beyond straight get better. It's easy to get sunk into a multiplayer game and drop hundreds of hours over the course of a few months, but Splitgate was different. Splitgate was boring, with no new updates, very limited opportunities for any actual fun, and the same few game modes that played the same every time, the initial excitement tanked. Consequently, the casual player base fled to pastures anew, leaving a dilute puddle of sweat behind to dominate. People who moved solely with teleports, headshotting new players into frustration from across the map, introducing a skill ceiling so high that it seems insurmountable and puts off new players even more. But you ask, why does this mean that So It Begins is such a cruel trophy? Because the fourth trophy in this list, 1047, requires you to win 1047 matches. Not complete, but win. Even if you have a 50% success streak with games lasting roughly 10 minutes apiece, you are looking at hundreds of hours of grind alongside some of the sweatiest tryhards in gaming, on the same maps in the same game modes. No casual player base, no events, no updates, no upgrades, no variety, no unlocks, just hours and hours and hours of boring, repetitive grind. You might then say, well, don't pick up the game in the first place then. And you would be valid, except for one thing, and yes, this does get worse. Splitgate released on the PlayStation in early access on July 27th, 2021, and due to being early access, the trophy list did not go live until several days or weeks later, meaning that any optimistic trophy hunter who bagged this game early to give it a few runs through would have earned So It Begins long before they even knew that 1047 existed. Even on PS and profiles, a website specifically for trophy hunters, so it begins sits at 91% achieved, and 1047 sits at 0.05%. And yeah, I would give this one a miss if I were you. And there's my list of the 10 cruelest trophies in gaming, in my experience at least. Trophy hunting was something I leapt onto as soon as I grabbed myself a PlayStation 3. I love going for all the trophies in a game, tackling every challenge, speedruns, collectibles, secret bosses and hard modes, but sometimes they can get a little bit nasty. I'm sure naturally you disagree with many of my choices, and well I mean that's your problem, but since you're here, you may as well tell me what your own top pick for the cruelest trophy in gaming might be, and why down in the comments. If you enjoyed my list, please subscribe to me here on YouTube, Twitch is my main platform so feel free to follow me over there if you'd like to see me sweat these trophies live, but I try to put out YouTube content as often as I can, and I really appreciate the support. Thank you so much for watching everybody, and I will see you in the next video.